All right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of DoD Contract Academy. I'm here with Andrew Everett, owner of Evertech. Andrew, how are you today? Doing very well. Thanks for, ha- thanks for having me, Richard. And it's been a good day so far. Good, good. So what? now I reached out to you, Andrew, because you had some interesting contracts with the government, contracts for um, different types of services, which some people have sent me questions about that, you know, I've been on other podcasts where people have asked about things like, you know, social media and religious services, which may have been some of the earlier work that you've done. And I know that you now have a a focus, you've done a few things, and you're looking at program management, some other areas. But so, uh, you know, from all accounts, this is a very successful company, selling to the government, very successful small business. And so I want to get you on here. And first, I want to learn more about you, the owner, you know, who are you? Where are you from? You know, talk to us a little bit about that and where yeah. you went to school and stuff. And then, then maybe we can get into why Evertech. So um, I'm originally from Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. So I um, went to school in Newport News, Christopher Newport University. Oh, nice. Highly recommend that university. A small school, but I feel like it's a perfect segue for a small business, you know, because if you're at a large business, you get lost in the mix. Right. You're just a number. Same thing with at a larger university. So mm-hmm. I feel like I was able to, you know, achieve and, you know, make myself um, and kind of learn my way. I feel like I would have been lost in the mix at a much larger institution. So I double majored in psychology and sociology, which I feel like is 100% the, you know, the reason why, like what I deal with you know, is dealing with people, um, sure. government, you know, and also employees, contractors, you know, and how to balance that. Um, so um, having that type of background, first understanding myself psychology wise, but then understanding groups of individuals, why there's certain trends, how to not get yourself stuck in a, you know, older area, because that's one of the biggest things I saw, you know, even just growing up during that era. You know, the early 2000s, you know, millennial, um, you know, grew up during the Facebook era. And you see all the companies that were thriving in the 2000s. Majority of them are gone. Yeah. You know, they're not in the, you know, uh, top 50. You know, that's one of the main reasons, you know, it's Amazon. It's Google. None of those companies were even ranked. So that's where we were talking about agility, being able to adapt. Um, being able to look at trends, see where things are going. Um, so, I think that's um, really smart. I think it's interesting too that you have a psychology degree, and you know from that background. And look, I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to poo-poo the you know the business oh, yeah. out there. But you know, sure, you can go to school to learn business. You can probably learn a lot of great things about accounting and whatnot. But the things have rapidly changed so much over the past twenty years. That A, I'm not sure how how valuable that is anyway, but B, having having a skill set or, you know, an interest area, whether it's a technology or another type of service, and being willing to go out and learn how things are really done. Right. Yeah. Like typically you're not like I can tell you, I've been through plenty of government contract training, but learning how it's really done, there are very few courses, for instance, that could that could teach you that, whether it's in a school or anywhere else. Um, and that goes for a lot of different things, right? I mean, kind of getting out there and getting your hands dirty and doing it. And I would imagine like psychology and just like you said, having a positive attitude and being able to adapt exactly. is, is huge. It's, you know, identifying, like you said, like you said, also understanding yourself, what motivates you and then also what motivates others too. So what motivates you? A business owner, you know, and I guess that's one of the things I'm a talker, you know, so I can talk um, some individuals. Um, don't want to talk as much, you know, I'm, and that's one thing I work on is my listening skills because I like talking so much. I think right. everyone else to hear me speak and, you know, that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, those are some of the things that you learn, you know, just by kind of going through that, but speeding through that after graduating college, I went and I did sales for a Xerox company. Okay. So business to business sales. And that was much harder than doing work with the government. <laughs> because if you're not hitting your quota, you're gone. Mm. You know, um, there's no plan around. You know, there's no 
you know, you're, you have three week, three um, three month training wheels where you're, you know, you can't get fired. But after that, you know, they're constantly bringing in people in. And that was also at a time where multifunctional printers and copiers and all that stuff was a dying breed. You know, I'm talking um, early to mid 2000s. People were getting printers, you know, that desktop printers for $100. They were giving them out with laptops, HP, um, because no one wanted to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a big, huge, multifunctional, you know, printer. And basically, it you know, and that's that's how a lot of organizations they they spend all that money buying it. But it was a dying breed. They saw that they could save money by getting individualized printers for Susie or Bob, right? right. In the huge thirty thousand, sixty thousand dollar lease, and uh, um, salespeople, you know, like myself, you know, we had quotas. And if you didn't hit those quotas, you're gone. What so, um, what did you what did you learn in that environment? I mean, I mean, I bet you learned a lot about sales. A. Oh, well, that's actually how I ended up getting my first governmental job. Um, because I was very, um, I guess, extrovert. I always wanted to be outside. I never wanted to be inside, um, you know, the office because I felt like I had to be the mayor of my, you know, territory. Right. Um, so I wanted to meet every single person. I never I always gave a business card because it's like you never know when you're going to have money. You know, something breaks down, whatever, referral. I went to every BNI. So it was, I was always out there. I was like, mm -hmm. I want everyone to know me. So that's how I was noticing how to generate the leads. And I guess a lot of that kind of, you know, segued into me getting um, recruited by this government contracting firm to be. You know, resource manager. And um, interesting. So, th were they a client of Xerox then? No, actually, they weren't. They were actually a company I cold called in Herndon, Virginia. Okay, interesting. So, so you cold called them. They obviously liked you, and then right. uh, you went to work for them. So now you are working for your contractor, essentially. Uh, for no, I was actually, you know, this company. So they were a hundred percent a staffing firm. I don't know if you ever heard of Signature Government Solutions. But they got bought by Soterra Defense Solutions within about 10 years for $50 million okay. of cash. But they hired over 300 SEI and above um, personnel. So, um, you know, that was, it was a very flat, small organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a resource manager, you were literally just, you know, recruit. But it, was, it wasn't just recruiting. It was because you're dealing with individuals in a classified space. Those individuals aren't. You can't market your clearance on LinkedIn or whatever. That's a security violation. Um, you know, so you have to, you have to know those individuals. You have to build relationships with those individuals. Um, and that was one of the things that I was constantly doing, you know, meeting them out. You know, obviously there were some job boards that they could post on their resume and everything. Yeah. Clearancejobs.com, others, et cetera. But you know, meeting those individuals because they're getting calls from every other organization. Why would they not want to work? Why would they want to work for you? Um, so that was where a lot of the desire to kind of do all what I'm doing came from, uh, because it wasn't just, you know, a corporate job where you're calling people, trying to recruit them. This right. is you're actually making sure. And then not only when they're hired, you're making sure because we were getting paid um, interestingly you know, a percentage of, you know, you know, a percentage of what um, they were getting paid based off of how long they were, they were working, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it was almost like we were our own entrepreneurs. We wanted to retain those individuals because the longer we retain them, the more we return money. It wasn't just like a spot bonus type thing. So anyway, um, that company got, grew, became a half a billion dollar company through acquisitions and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, you know, I progressed within that organization. And at that point in time, that's when I decided to um, branch off and kind of start on my own um, because I felt that, you know, why not at that point in time? I wasn't at the time married. I am now. Didn't have any kids. I do have one in the way. So, um, you know, it was at that point in time, I was like, OK, why not try this? If it doesn't work out, I can always go back and get hired by an organization. All right. Well, it seems like things are working out for you. Um, you know, and there, there's a lot of different ways out there for anyone listening where you can 
look up, you know, what companies are doing, you know, and, and I don't want to um, necessarily get behind any of those tools right now, but I use a, a few different ones. You could also go to USA Spending if anyone wants to look up Evertech and see, but why don't you uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, now you're, you're getting out, you want to start your business. What were your initial thoughts for where you wanted to focus? Um, well, a lot of it, you know, honestly, I couldn't really focus on the intelligence community because you have to have the facility clearance in order to get that. So you have to make baby steps. You got to get that initial facility clearance um, in order to do the DOD work because it's not about your own personal clearance. Mm -hmm. You know, as an organization, that doesn't matter. And I see a lot of questions and answers. You know, that helps if you're the owner to have a personal clearance, but it's not a facility clearance. So it's that chicken in the egg. And in order to do a lot of that DOD work, and I'm not even at the level that we want to from a facility where, um, you know, where there's a couple of, you know, there's another level that we want to go up. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's the chicken in the egg because it opens up the opportunities. Uh, so I knew the DOD was the target market, um, you know, uh, so that that was kind of the main, main in Army, Navy. Air Force. Okay, so you want to uh, target the DoD, and you wanted, but what was the what were the services that you wanted to perform? It okay, was services, so, right? and I also take it back a step. Mm -hmm. One of the other huge things, because you know, um, I obviously didn't serve, but majority of the individuals that I hired at my previous organization, I say almost it was up like ninety plus percent. They were veterans, right. and a lot of the reasons why I got referrals because when you treat individuals well. You know, they're like, oh, hey, you know what? I actually work with so and so. They're either retired, getting out, and, you know, let me get you their number, let me get your contact information. Those individuals typically have security clearance in order to do that work. And that's one of the huge things um, within the DOD industrial, um, industrial base. They want to do, you know, they want to return and hire veterans. They don't want to, you know, re they don't want to have to take a risk and hire a person that's completely green, that doesn't understand the structure, doesn't understand chain of command. Yep. Um, and, you know, that, that throws off their environment. So I take that back a step. You know, that was another huge reason why from a targeting perspective. Yeah. Also, I knew from, you know, who my connections are um, relationship-wise, you know, and, uh, and also who the government wants to retain, um, you know, DOD is the target market for. Yeah. Well, you know, it also makes sense from a, a business perspective to hire veterans or yes. I think really a really great target is if you could find someone that is in the reserves or National Guard uh, to potentially hire. Because what you're getting is uh, not only, you're, you know, got it, you're, you're helping vets, you know, which kind of is patriotic and all that, but you're selling to the military. It A, helps to have somebody that speaks the language, right? Mm -hmm. B, they have networks, which you may or may not need, but still, it does help to know people. And, it, and they're also coming with a specialty, yes. you know, and it may be aligned with what you're selling. They may be coming with a security clearance. And if they are in the yes. Guard or Reserves, they are coming with a security clearance mm -hmm. that the government's maintaining. Yes. <laughs> right? So you don't have to do that. Um, there are just a lot of in there. They're still connected They're especially if they're in sales and they're now not that they're using their government email to to do any of that, but the fact that they're connected and that they're working in the government every day gives them kind of their finger on the pulse, if you will, of some of yes. what are going on. Yes, so. and that's one of the hugest things. Um, you know, although I mentioned with agility, and I know that the government's, you know, it's one of those buzzwords that's kind of like a, you know, it irks some, but, you know, I think now it's one of those things where it's like, well, we have to be because, and we'll get to that probably a little bit later, um, you know, the biggest things is, you know, like you mentioned, understanding that culture, understanding the nomenclature, understand, understand the chain of command. Those are the most critical things. And it's a huge uh, risk reducer when those contracting officers are looking and making evaluations. Oh, you know, we see that, you know, you are, you are trying to hire veterans for this support. You know, you are trying to, you're, you know, you're not just trying to go and seek someone else. You're not trying to waste time. And they, cause it's, it's risk. They don't understand. They don't may not know those individuals, but if they do, that makes it 
less risky for them. Um, and that's huge and critical. And, you know, I've, I've been at these bases. It's not like I haven't been and haven't worked also as a contractor. So I know, I know how the cores and, uh, you know, the program managers, they want to retain those individuals that are, that have put in the work and then are, you know, getting out on the street and potentially struggling um, yeah. to find a job. They want to get those individuals and they're trying to find that vehicle. Um, and it's, you know, that's one of the things where for us from an organization, we're trying to fit that. And that's where, you know, we do have huge initiatives and the majority of our workforce, but if they not, if they weren't you know, previous veteran or uh, retiree, they're military spouse because those are individuals that already have base access so they can immediately support some of those works. Like you mentioned for some of those earlier works. Um, that is really, Absolutely. it's really a good point. And it's something that, you know, I haven't, t- I don't think I've talked about that on the podcast and I probably should, I definitely should having a military spouse myself, <laughs> right? Yeah. The power of a military spouse, I would not, that is not something to brush off. I mean, you're talking about, if from a hiring perspective, you're talking about an individual that has got to, even without having a job, has got to tolerate and deal with um, some situations that most people just will never have to tolerate, right? Like having, you know, if you have kids and your spouse is constantly being deployed, well, I can tell you, my spouse immediately became uh, the person financially running our family, mm-hmm. responsible for everything the kids were doing and working at the same time and yeah. all of those things that were going up. In addition to that, they're tied into the base. They're on the bases all the time. They're working, they're networking, a lot of deals. It's funny. I've never, I don't think I've ever talked about this. So a lot of deals have happened, um, whether we're talking about government contracting or just other things within the military, because one spouse talked to somebody else's spouse. Oh, it's so true. You know, and then, yeah. and then, oh, well, hey, I haven't thought about because, you know, I'm going to listen to my, uh, my director of operations, right? So, you know, that is, it's a very powerful tool. And we're talking about some really smart, hardworking, tough women and men out there that have had yes. to uh, had to go through this. Um, very interesting that you, you bring up the spouses. Can we, can we and back? they're looking for those opportunities. And a lot of times, you know, they don't know the way um, or it's, it may be, you know, because when you're there, when you're actually physically working in the building, you know, it's you may know the organizations that may be potentially, you know, but if it's a military spouse and they may not work in some of these facilities, they may not know which way or the access is. So, um, you know, that's one of the main things where just, and a lot of it, I feel like, you know, just because things evolving now more so because of obviously Indeed and all those other various different things now, you know, it's, it's now more spread out than what it used to be before because it used to, you know, it used to be hard to find these because you actually have physically and all, you know, but now you're much more presently seeing them during the time frames. And I think the organizations, they see the value because like you mentioned, they understand all the stressors. They understand mm-hmm. the terminology, no different. And sometimes sure. like you mentioned even more because yeah. they have to deal with it all the time, you know, it never leaves. I have been, so, I've literally been, Kicked out of rooms by spouses because we were talking too much in acronyms. In fact, so any of my military buddies come back around and I'm always like, hey, I'll, I'm going to talk to them for a little bit. But as soon as you guys uh, start talking in acronyms, I, I'm out of here. Um, hey, let, let's so let's back up to, um, I just want to talk a little bit about your initial contracting efforts. Could you tell me a little bit about the first contract that you won and how you got it? And do you remember? Um, I think or maybe one probably, of the first ones. Yeah, one of the first ones, it was probably just like, you know, a full and open bid. You know, I think a lot of them, you know, I think a lot of small businesses only try to stay in the swim lane and look up for, uh, you know, things that are set aside for them. Um, and that may honestly not be the best case. A lot of times these full and open bids, there's not a lot of large businesses looking at them either because, you know, Lockheed Martin, Lidos, they don't want to even get a, you know, because we're on some task orders with them. And they don't even want us to bring something to the table if it's not 15 million plus. Yeah. You know, they're like, that's a waste of our time, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so they're not even going to look at those opportunities if it's not steered or it's on a vehicle. So 
Um, you just kind of have to look and open your mind a little bit more, um, I think, for small businesses. So uh, I think the first initial was born open opportunity and it was probably not even that many organizations that bid it. Um, and that was probably the reason why we won. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of it is you have to get out there, you have to submit bids. You can't expect that, you know, someone else is going to submit that or we're not prepared. If you can provide that support service, then, um, and if, I think the one that we initially wanted was like a Key West, um, you know, kind of like materials management support services contract with, with the Navy. Um, so, and on it, and, and it was, it was, I, we had, you know, that's actually snowballed to a lot of Navy wins for us, like later on in the future. So smart. So kind of working after you got awarded, whether, whether it was lucky or you guys wrote a great proposal or whatever it was, um, sounds like you did good work and you were rewarded with more work. Right. And oh, probably, yeah. I'm guessing since you are a talker, which you mentioned, right. That you like to be, uh, be out there. I'm, I'm assuming that you oh, spent yes. time talking with the CEO and the PM and, and the users, maybe people they were working prior with. to COVID, I was visiting every single contract physically, you know, not only to, you know, because that was the exact same thing I had learned from previous, you know, always met. Now it's different, you know, now these bases are more locked down, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to meet you on and majority of these individuals are working for it um, from the government from home. That's a really interesting point for people to consider if, if you're not aware you're right. I mean, I so I still have a, a pretty large network in the military, both active and government civilian. Half the time I'm talking to them, the conversation is them at home, yeah. not them in the office. So a lot of these bases are um, kind of ghost towns, if you will. Still, they're still not fully populated every day like they were pre-COVID. Well, you know, before COVID, the ideal was it's a joint community. We'll work at the bases, you know, military, civilian, government. Um, contractors and everything, but now it's we don't only want the military and contractors at these bases, and the government civilians will work from home, and you know and that's where I think there's got to be more agility, um, because you know you are losing from the government side um, some of that talent because yeah. some of these operational duties and responsibilities from contractors don't necessarily need to be done, you know, um, physically. Yeah, in person and it's true. Um, figuring those things out, you know, I think will lead to better production. Yeah, I think they have, um, I think they have a problem on their hands that they're trying to figure out, which is you have to attract great employees, right? Whether we're talking about the military or government, civilian or contractors, we have to attract great people. We have to retain great people, and you also want to do that especially in the military, especially if you're in a combat unit of any kind, you also want to be able to foster that esprit de corps, that sense of mission and urgency. And that's a that's an interesting formula. Like how do you how do you put all that together when you have some people working from home? Because I think that having people work from home, contractors or or whoever, I think that's attractive to some people. It may enable them to bring in more qualified, capable people. But you might be losing a little bit of that esprit de corps that you get in the military and that morale and especially in the DOD organizations, right? That you're going to get just by being around the, you know, the mission, right? Whether you're a GS or a active duty military or a contractor, right? Yeah. Um, you've seen any of that. I've seen, you know, I've seen it's, it's been a, and I've seen a whole big transition because it's, you know, um, during COVID, a lot of it was, um, you know, everyone had to initially draw back in all of our contracts that we had in all the states. Everyone had to go and work from home. And then it was, OK, we're now going to go back on to. And, you know, all my family, the government employees, my father, government employee for the Federal Reserve, my sister, government employee for the Federal Reserve. And, you know, kind of it is interesting because they would try to incentivize Federal Reserve by like saying, oh, we're going to give you free lunch on certain days. And I was like, you know, I asked my sister, I was like, how often was that working? She was like, it only worked initially. And then hmm. people start figuring out, like, I'd rather make my lunch and work from home than go and get a free lunch. Yeah, get a free lunch. Yeah. You know, and it's like, um, and I and I completely understand because, um, you know, and this is just from even a project management standpoint, there's some mm -hmm. duties and responsibilities I know that have to be physically done. Sure. Um, you know, 
the classified area, those type of duties, some mm-hmm. meetings, you know, but some of the, if it's emails, if your duties aren't necessarily um, need to be done physically there. Um, even for instance, like social media or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, then there's going to be issues because that talent pool will say, okay, well, there's another job over here that will allow me to do my job this way. will save me all this money. And in this economy where everything's increased, um, you know, people make judgment decisions based off of that. So I yeah. feel like there's got to be some agility um, to that. Plus, not to mention the agility of, um, you know, the government, they look at prices and it's all based off of historical prices. The historical prices used to work, you know, pre-inflation, you know, you can't look at historical prices for houses and say, okay, that's what, you know, I'm going to get now, yeah. you know, because it doesn't work, you know, and also houses constantly go up. And that's why they got, the government has to look at prices going up for even recompetes. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, as a small business, you know, it's, I know the big thing, you know, it's a, the biggest, hardest thing that I try to tell the government customers, um, you know, it's hard to, you know, on, on uh, like outside of contract vehicles, um, you know, and that's the reason why I really advocate for, you know, small businesses to initially when they're starting, definitely get on, um, you know, as many contract vehicles as a subcontractor um, or be on a contract vehicle because that's where you can express the value on these full and open bids that everyone else can see. Yeah. The government's looking for a price and they're going to base that based off of the historical information sure and that's currently the unfortunate thing so you say contract vehicle so you and i know what that term is but everybody listening isn't familiar so why don't you describe in your own words what a contract vehicle is a contract vehicle is um usually either an agency like let's say for instance like the navy they have seaport or disa they may have like encore as their preferred vehicle for how they want to acquire certain types of services and um, though, you know, they usually will have historical information of what type of services fall. It's called category management. Mm-hmm. And this has been a huge thing the government's been trying to get. It makes it easier for them to um, procure, you know, goods or services because it's saying, okay, these things fall in these categories. I buy things that fall in these categories from this, you know, strategic sourcing vehicle. Um, right. The DHS, they mm-hmm. have. Um, a lot. That's how they buy everything is through strategic sourcing vehicles. I don't right. use. And if, unless you're on that vehicle, you won't be visible to the government customer or you won't see any of those opportunities. It's interesting. Um, there's a uh, in, in, I'm partnered with this company now, but um, there's a company called partnered, not meaning I own part of the company, but that, you know, we have a relationship and I, they're the only ones I do have a relationship with because uh, kind of walking down this path, right? If you have, so category management and contract vehicles, pre-compete companies essentially in those categories, right? So if I'm, I probably used this analogy before, but if I'm running my acquisitions branch and we do a lot of cyber related efforts and I have a bunch of servers and everything, I know I'm going to have cybersecurity services to pay for over the next three years. I know that I can't predict everything that I'm going to need. And Mm -hmm. we both know how long it takes to win some of these contracts, right? So from putting a solicitation out there, doing your market research, solicitation, get it out there, get all the responses, review them to award, that could take 12 months. That could take 18 months. In some cases, it takes longer, just depends on the size and everything. So this is a way of doing that. I pre-compete it fast, maybe 200 companies. Takes me a year and a half, but I get 20 companies on there or however many there are now we we'll call it the Ricky Howard contract vehicle. Now I have this contract vehicle and I could put you on contract really fast. I've already competed it. I still might have a small competition, a small fast one amongst the, the businesses on there, but um, I don't have to put that on Sam.gov necessarily. I can go out and it, it is extremely important. I think you make a good point having multiple ones because different offices like to use different vehicles, right? Like yes. for, I never used a GSA. It's not because I had any problem with GSA. It's just... We had other vehicles in place that were very convenient for us. We used them all the time. And those are the ones that we wanted to use. And the I big think one saw... right now is Oasis. And, you know, like 
us right now, we're unfortunately not going to be able to be a prime. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the huge things as a subcontractor. We're trying to position ourselves to be on a um, team with that, you know, that can win a bunch of task orders. Because and Oasis is a services contract. Is that correct? It's a okay. huge, it's a GWAC. So mm -hmm. it's a government wide acquisition um, contract. So um, it's not specific to one particular agency. It's they now, you know, the government, this is where I say they're at agility, you know. Now a huge buzzword is best in class for these mm -hmm. um, contract vehicles. So even if an agency has a contract vehicle where they can get those cybersecurity services, like you were mentioning, yeah, they can look and see. Oh, okay, hold up. GSA has this acquisition vehicle called Oasis, which is technically a best in class, which they means that they had a higher threshold and standard for mm -hmm. the primes to meet to be on it, um, and. You know, probably also better pricing and all that stuff for the government. It's a, it's a, these, that's a stuff. great point. You're, I mean, you keep hitting it right out, right out of the ballpark because there's we use other agencies' contract vehicles all the time, all the time. Now, GSA applies to everybody, right? But like NASA Soup has NASA in its name. But if you go and look at who NASA and I've used it, so you can look at who they've Air Force, Army. You know, people yes. use NASA Soup. It just needs to fit within their category. Mm -hmm. you know, Often we'll just go and say, "Hey, do you have ceiling on the contract vehicle?" And as long as they have ceiling, um, and those are huge GWACs, like you call call them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're huge, just usually hundreds of companies on them, and you know the the ceilings are astronomical, and they get recompeted every couple of years. But another thing about those vehicles that you mentioned, which is which is something that you need to consider if you're listening to this, is that let's say there are NASA Soup and um, NXG and Seaport opportunities that are going to go out to only those contract holders, right? The primes on there. Often the opportunities will not go out on a SAM.gov. So the only way to know about them is to either be on the contract vehicle as a prime or sub, have a relationship with a prime where they might let you in on that. Or in, when I was talking about Govly, this is really where, this is like the longest way of getting back to that. But yeah. Govly, anyone could check it out. You could check it out. What they have is a place where the primes, and it's mainly around cybersecurity and IT related, but um, primes and subs will be on there and they will, those companies will put, hey, these are opportunities that are coming to us. You're probably not going to see them from a SAM.gov or from whatever research tool you're using, but it is a way for a small business to see, okay, what is coming out on these vehicles? So if you're interested in that, you can check Govly out and um, just to be aware of, okay, well, maybe here are some of the opportunities that are out there and, and look at that as a possible avenue. Yes. And, and that's, you know, as a small business, you have to be really good if you're trying to succeed. On uh, Like if you're trying to just initially get there, you have to really be exceptional, at least just the SAM. Like that's what I call like the simple, you know, because once, because if you can't get that right, then even if you have access to all these other vehicles where you're trying to um, search for opportunities and find your niche, you're just going to get lost there too, you know? So you have to be able to kind of first start off, get that, you know, understand like, okay, where's my target here? Can I see these opportunities? Can I respond to these sorts of thoughts? Can I get it there? Okay. Cause then that's the, okay, I made it here. Now I can deal with next gen. I can deal with NASA suit. And, you know, then that leads, because when you look at a lot of these mid tier, like, you know, mid size, more, you know, I'm not saying like the Lockheed's or Lighters. Yeah. Northwoods, um, but the mid-tier, you know, smalls, mm -hmm. they killed those vehicles like in a good way because they understand how to really just make the snowball effect and just make it rain. And they yep. they they get a whole, you know, once it's a you know proof of concept with one, then it then it all comes through because everyone's like, hey, one come on. Yep. Um, so okay. that's what that's the door. mature out of those vehicles and, and um, you know, a lot of those areas. And that's where we're trying to get. Let know? me let me let me talk to you about your your business development strategy and your kind of philosophy, because it's obviously changed over the years. And, you know, we can see, you know, when I look through some of your contracts, I see things like health services administrator, uh, services for social media administrative clerk, uh, administrative assistants, library. So a lot of different things. But then, you know, as you start progressing, now the, the focus on things like program management becomes 
uh, more important, important, I guess, to you and your organization. But so I guess there, there's two things I want to talk about. The the progression from going to some of these different areas to a more focused, hey, this is what we want to offer the government. But also, you also mentioned, hey, we probably want just a openly competed solicitation. What was the progression going from that to your business development strategy now, right? And you've talked around a lot of that, but I'd like to hear where you're at now. And as far as this is how we target an organization, this is how we find opportunities. This is how we influence, like, what what are you doing? What's working for you right now? Well, I feel like the best, the best thing was working the best is responding to as many of these sources on these pre-solicitations because you have to have these, you know, the government doesn't know if you're just listed on sand, the government doesn't know who you are. They will never know who you are, you know, and they won't, you know, they're not going to find you. You know, that's, that's not expecting them to to find you. So a lot of my day is, um, you know, another podcast I hugely highly recommend is Game Changers Government Contracting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Lejeune, um, you know, uh, I think I was also on that one as well. But okay. uh, also his book is huge and critical. I also recommend that. Um, but you have to get out there. You have to market to these agencies a lot. Yeah. You have to have your capability statement ready to go with your listed um, contracts, past performance. Past performance is key, you know. Within the government, you always hear that past performance. I don't care what the past performance is. It could be, you know, picking up gum. But if you have past performance for picking up gum, it shows that you were good at picking up gum. That's yeah. fine. You know, you need to have someone that's going to say that you're a reputable organization. You know, you can't. Um, there's so many like um, small businesses I had met that were early on that never really got anywhere. And a lot of it was because, you know, they were like, oh, well, we're too niched, you know. You have to evolve. Like we just recently, we're doing some environmental services, you know. Um, you know, you have to evolve. You have to understand that there's um, areas in support that the government is going to need. Yeah. Um, you know, if I, you know, um, that you know, if you can find, and a lot of it, you know, my background is personal people, per- personnel management solutions. Um, the whole entire everything within the organization is finding a solution for, you know, the agency, you know, the government's looking for a solution and our organization is there to provide a solution, whether it's through people, you know, whether it's through technology, you know, whether it's through product, you know, we're there to provide that, you know, there's other various different efforts that don't even get listed yeah. um, in those various databases that we provided contracts and support services. Sure. Just, because not everything is always, you know, listed. But yep, um, true. You, know, you have to have that, you know, under like I guess business development background to think. Okay, well, I don't have to be too niche to say, okay, this is not something that I may pursue. Because um, during this era, where so many various different procurements are being delayed, delayed, mm-hmm. we've had so many various different contracts that we are current primes on that, like. You know, everything, you know, everything is delayed, whether you're getting your um, follow on, whether you're getting anything, everything's delayed. And it's because, um, like I mentioned, a lot of the government, they're working at home. They don't have visibility of what's happening on site. They're expecting the contractors to have their own visibility of what's happening. And that's at every agency. Yeah. Uh, uh, so um, understanding that the a lot of the administration is, is being delayed, you can't expect that these forecasts are up to date. No, coming out on time, um, you know. So, no, I'm submitting a ton of source of thoughts. So you, you've said that a, you've said that a few times, and I, I mean, I've done entire episodes on this. So if anyone wants to check it out, I don't want it to be a, a source of thought uh, total discussion because because we're, we're almost out of time. And I have a few really uh, key things I want to ask you, but really quickly, value of responding to a source of thought, in your opinion, huge. We won contracts from a source of thought. You know, you're only going to get sole source contracts. Yeah, well, not only that, but it's it's like you know, the government wants to make it easy, especially towards the end of the fiscal year. They don't want to have to write a full RFQ, RP. They just want to just throw something out there, an idea. It's like who who can provide this, and then they're the only ones going to be discussing it with you. So if you don't respond to that source of thought, 
expect to not see anything more from that at all. This you know, psychology like, degree of yours, I think, really, uh, I think, really paid off. For uh, I mean, you're 100 percent right, and that's your. You're also pre solicitation for everyone listening. So I always say, once the solicitation comes out, the handcuffs are on. The, yeah. the, the contracting officer, the program manager, they're not talking to you. If they, if you ask a question, it's probably going to be answered publicly. But before that, it's a, hey, I'm just, it's the research phase. It's what can yes. we do? So you are doing exactly what you should be doing. Get it's your probably why you're so successful. To, get your pre, you know, get your capability statement out. To, even if you're not even a bit, you know, that's one thing where I'm like, you know, why not? Even yeah. if it's something that I'm not bidding, boom. Sorry, you got a capability statement, boom, pre-solicitation. Cause then then they know your name, your company, they're like, oh, we're you know, and then it's like, oh well, you know, I'm I'm just it's one of those things because there might be something else. You have to get those get that information out to them. Who writes your source of thought? Do you write them yourself? Do you have staff that do that for you? Um, we have some individuals that also help, but predominantly I handle the source of thoughts. Um, you know, I, I mean, I have so many various templates. A lot of these things, you want to make it easy. You know, you, you yeah. want to have a three page, you want to have a five page, you want to have a 10 page. Those are typically the amount of pages. Um, you And you, you kind of know what the answers, and the common questions that they're going to ask. Mm -hmm. So you want to have those and you just do a quick little tailoring. Um, but, you know, you don't want to spend hours on source of thoughts or pre-solicitation responses. It's quick. Boom. I just want to get this information out to you. Yeah, no, really smart. And I think, you know, you mentioned it. You've you've won contracts from submitting because most companies are not submitting the source of thought. Most companies are going to go after the solicitation because that's where because, you know, at the usually at the end of a source of thought, it doesn't necessarily equal a contract for you. It could six months from now, right? It could four months from now. But what it does, if it if it doesn't equal that, it can in some cases, but um, it can be your foot in the door with a meeting with the program manager. It automatically tells them who you are. It, yes. You can influence, you can recommend, you can put anything into a source of thought, right? Hey, if I'm 8A, I recommend you do this 8A. By the way, you can give me a sole source contract because I'm 8A. Or hey, I'm not 8A, so I recommend you make this small business a set aside only, right? Or whatever, whatever it is that you are, use these certifications. This um, is one anything. quick thing I'll say, because my sister, she works at Google and she mm -hmm. works in their ad department and she's been trying to sell me for years for like Google ads. And I'm like, I'm not going to waste my time with that because the government's not going to look me up on Google. The only way that the government's going to have my information is if I submit a source of thought or submit information, capabilities, show up at an industry day you know, those various different ways, like those, a lot of these virtual industry days that are happening, signing up for almost every single one of them, because that's how these government agencies, even if you don't attend, get the information of like, you know, who's, who's, who's potentially, and then a lot of times they'll send you sometimes, you know, sometimes because of OPSEC, they might send you a slideshow, Yeah, um, but you want to make sure that you signed up for those. And that gives you information that other people don't have, right? So you're now, by the time you get to, if, you, if it is going to be competed, you've submitted a source of thought, you've probably influenced the solicitation. I know some companies that write the solicitation for the government, by the way, and just send it mm -hmm. in. And it's a lot of work for the government. So depending on yeah. who you get, that might be the, but you know, you, you also, if you get the meeting, you know more about it than, which allows you to write a better proposal than somebody that hasn't had that meeting or now you have the meeting, the relationship, you've written a better proposal, you're more likely to win. Um, this could go on for another hour very easily because I'm enjoying the conversation. But I wanted to know a couple things really quickly before we close. One, what's in store for you and your business going forward, um, aside from your, your focus on program management and just providing value to the government, and then maybe concluding with what would your advice be to a small business that's just getting started in government contracting? All right, so I, I first start with the advice piece. Um, for a small business just getting started, I'd say the biggest thing is focusing on those sources, thoughts, getting a template out, a capability statement, um, listening to podcasts like yourself, um, you know, game changers for government po um, contracting, you know, reading information, knowledge is key. You know, um, without gathering that knowledge, um, it, it's, it's going to be hard. Um, 
you know, learning some of the basics of program and project management, I think that's a huge critical thing for the government because it's a big risk for the government to also um, trust a new organization to run a project if they don't understand the principles of project management. Um, the government does not want to see, you know, contracts fail. So um, having having some of those things mitigated, I'm not saying that you have to get PMP certified, um, but, you know, just having some of this, those foundational understandings, it also helps you tailor some of those proposals. A lot of that language is critical. Um, so having that will help you a lot, responding to source of thoughts. What's happening for us as a business going forward, um, you know, cloud services is an area that I've been, you know, individually training myself, AWS, mm -hmm. um, you know, just got trained on solution architecture during this last year. Okay. And because that's a huge area. Everything is from, you know, everything is not being done physically. It costs too much. Things get outdated. You want to out, you know, it's all cloud. Everything's cloud. Email, everything. Um, the government's been on, um, you know, they've all migrated to the cloud. So that's the area that we're um, we're trying to focus in on, um, getting out of some of those, you know, um, earlier phases, administrative. Those are good introductions in the doors into those offices where you can meet a lot of those key individuals that make decisions. Um, but um, focusing into the, you know, the, you know, the program project management, agile. Um, and then also the cloud services, those are the area um, because you know, that's the infrastructure that every, that's the backbone for everything right now. Really is. There's, there's a big transition happening right now and there's a lot of um, there's concern and there's opportunity, right? Uh, and there are, I mean, we don't think about it, Amazon, you know, their biggest, you know, it's not their, their sales that they have from selling everything that you can basically get anything from. It's their cloud services that's, you know, making the majority of the money. Um, you know, Google and everything is everything's on the cloud. Yeah, um, Microsoft has a yes, has a I mean, everything. You know, it's it's all as a service. So being able to understand it, me from a business standpoint, that was huge and critical um, because that was the area and market that I wanted to transition. Kind of seeing those trends, seeing those areas. Uh, my father, he was telling me, like, because he's been in the federal IT print division of the, um, and he had, you know, he had been telling me for years, Amazon, Amazon. So that um, kind of was, you know, where a huge, huge area of focus is going to be cloud program management. Yeah. Um, and then obviously still supporting the, the DOD on mission critical support services, but, right. Um, you know, following where I feel like the mission, the need is. And um, I think with, you know, you see all these meetings, even this, uh, you know, majority of meetings that even the government wants to have are going to be through Teams or Zoom. You know, they're not going to want to do it in person. So. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And there's there's a ton of opportunity out there for cloud. A lot of problems to solve, a lot of big problems to solve. Uh, I'm glad you're focused there. And I apologize, my alarm uh, went off and was on the Zoom call. And you, I don't know if you guys heard my kids screaming upstairs during our snowstorm. But um, look, Andrew, it has been awesome having you on the podcast. Uh, congratulations on your upcoming addition to your family, by the way. So thank you. I wanted to make sure. That next month. So yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Well, your your world is just about to get that much better. So um, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for what you're doing for the country. Yes. And, um, and also, by the way, uh, we talked about a, a, a few podcasts. Another one that's really good is uh, the Contracting Officer Podcast, I want to say it's yes. called. Really great. I that one as well. Yeah, that's really good if you want to understand the FAR. Those guys are really well-researched and you know, if you want to really have some deep understanding of the regulations, uh, that's a really good one. So um, thanks for coming on. You have uh, given a lot of great advice for the businesses out there. In the show notes for everyone listening, I am going to put a, a link to Andrew's LinkedIn account and his website so you can learn more about 
him. And if you want to connect with him, you can do so there. And if you have any questions, you can head over to dodcontract.com and you can re request a consultation. We have some great information on there that's free that you can look at. Uh, check out our other podcast episodes, leave a review, subscribe. Andrew, thanks again for coming on. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Hopefully we'll get a follow-up maybe a year from now and see how you're crushing it. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it, like I said, once again. And and like I said, I'm glad for what you're doing, being able to just help this community and everything. And also thank you for your service. You know, it's it's a huge value. And you know, trust me, you know, we need more individuals like yourself. Uh, so I appreciate everything that you do for the country. Well, thank you, Andrew. I really do appreciate that. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone listening. And we will see you next time.